Dementia Researcher podcast, talking careers, research, conference highlights, and so much more. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Dementia Researcher podcast. In this show, we're exploring the unique challenges and triumphs of juggling a demanding career in academia with the equally demanding role of motherhood. But rather than the usual discussion around school runs, runny noses and late night working, in this show, we're backing up a bit and we're going to be talking about working during pregnancy, about maternity leave and about returning to work. And I'd like to think that this isn't just a message for the ladies. So men don't switch off just yet. So if this resonates with you, stay tuned. Hello, I'm Emily Spencer. I'm a PhD student at University College London. And on the 10th of November, I went on maternity leave. And yes, I am still on maternity leave, but I'm somehow convincing myself that hosting today's podcast doesn't actually count as work. Um, And one of the reasons I agreed to host this show is that myself and today's incredible guests are uniquely qualified to discuss this important topic. Because whilst my child is now 11 weeks old, My guests are only a few months behind me and will themselves be going on maternity leave very soon. But that's enough from me. Let's meet the guests and get the news from them. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Laura Prato and Dr. Ashling McFall. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. Hi. And let's do some uh, proper introductions. So Ashling, why don't we start with you? So why don't you tell us a bit about where you work, what you do, and a little bit about your family situation. Thanks very much for having me today. Um, so as you said, my name is Ashlyn McFall. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Glasgow. Um, I currently work on a, a, pro, a ischemic stroke project. Um, I've only been in the post for about three months, but my PhD was actually in preclinical stroke. Um, and before this, I spent two and a half years um, researching um, neurodegeneration and learning the memory before coming back to um, coming back to stroke. Um, in terms of my family, so I have a daughter and she is three and a half years old. She was born in 2020. <laughs> and um, right now I am 35 weeks pregnant with baby number two. So baby is due in the middle of March and I'm on the countdown um, I think I have 20 days left of work before I finish on the last day of February. Do you know what you're having for your second baby? I don't know, actually. I didn't know with the first, and we decided to try and keep it the same. So resisted the strong, strong, strong temptation <laughs> <laughs> and didn't find out what it is. Excellent. Um, and Laura, it's great to meet you as well. Could you tell me a bit about yourself as well? Great to meet you as well, Emily um, and Ashley, and lovely to be here today. Um, so my name's Laura Prato. I work at the University of Liverpool, um, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow, funded by the NIH, um, funded by the NIHR and the Alzheimer's Society. Um, and my main research at the minute is looking at dementia care navigation services in the community, um, and looking at whether they help people access further services, and um, whether they improve well-being. Um, and what kind of populations they're reaching. Um, and I've been there about 18 months now. And I've worked on a variety of, of different projects in that time. Um, and I have a four and a half year old little boy. Um, and I'm currently 24 weeks pregnant with my second baby. Um, and I also don't know what I'm having. Uh, but I'm due at the end of May. You guys both have like amazing self-control there. There was absolutely no way I was not going to find out. I just felt like don't double your workload I wasn't going to plan names for like boys and girls there was no way um but yeah thank you guys so much I don't know if you know each other I haven't met either of you before so it's good to meet you both and to share a little about me so as I said earlier I'm a PhD student based at UCL in London so I've actually been at UCL for around three years now. So I started firstly as a research assistant on an Alzheimer's Society um, project looking at post-diagnostic care. Um, And my PhD is looking at communication between GPs, people with dementia and their carers around advanced care planning and planning for the end of life in general. Um, I am a new parent. So um, my son arrived on his due date, which I was very appreciative of, back in November 
So he's 11 weeks old. Um, so yeah, it's all very new for me, I would say. Um, and yes, I did not have the self-control. I had to find out 20 week scan, first question, what are we looking at here? Um, so that's the introductions done and let's get on with the show. So to help set the scene a little, previous shows have talked about the practicalities of managing family life and a research career, whereas today we're going to come at this from a bit of a different angle and consider how you actually get through working um, during pregnancy, the effects on your career, life after maternity leave, as well as the eventual return to work, or not as the case may be. So what we hope to do is bring to the surface some of those seldom discussed issues in the hope that that will um, help others realize that they're not alone and, you know, maybe even provide some advice um, for those who are about to go through the same thing, who might be planning on going through the same thing at some point in the future. So to start with, I'd love to hear about what you guys' experiences have been of working while pregnant. Um, So maybe starting right at the beginning, Um, how did you decide when to tell your team or your supervisor or or how did they react when you told them? Um, I don't know if either of you want to go first, maybe Ashley? I suppose first time around um, (laughs) was a little different as I was three days into a new post. (laughs) So I had, I was writing up my PhD thesis at the time and I'd secured like a research assistant post and I started it on the Monday and I think I had my 12 week scan on the Wednesday. And so after I did that scan, I thought, okay, I think I need to, I need to think I need to tell this new boss. So that was a little bit, bit scary. Um, but I knew I needed to tell her for kind of health and safety uh, reasons. Um, and she was fantastic about it. Like she was so supportive of it, even though she'd only known me a few days. Um, and yeah, she actually even extended my short term post. Just to give me a bit more matern- maternity pay, which was great. Uh, this time around, I had a little bit of a different situation in that I was working in one job, but about not like about to leave it to then go to a new job. So I had like two bosses basically to go and tell. So I needed to tell my current boss. I told them really early for again health and safety reasons. There are lots of things when I work in a lab, and so there's and certain risks um so it's important that the manager knows early on but i was due to start a new position in november and so i felt i needed to go and inform my new pi um so that we could make plans for how we would want to manage that um manage only come up to the job for a short period of time before stopping and uh what was great was then we like organized a meeting with all our, with the collaborators on the project and so everybody knew what was going on and we had a plan for realistically what can you achieve in three or four months before you go. <laughs> so we both, I suppose both occasions were not exactly sort of textbook in terms of me yeah, trying yeah. to tell, having to tell my employer. How about for you, Laura? Was it a bit more straightforward or a similar situation? Um, and so first time around, I was about four months into the PhD. Um, so I just had to tell my supervisors really. Um, and that's fine. The the PhD program that I was on um, paid enhanced maternity leave as part of the program. Um, so all that happened was I had to apply to have my sort of um, submission date, I think it's called an end date, extended by the time I took off. Um, and there was no problems around that, so that was really good. Um, and everybody was really supportive, and it, it was fine. Um, I mean, what happened to me was in the middle of, well, the very end of that maternity leave um, coincided with when COVID sort of started and we went into lockdown. So I returned to work in May 2020, and I think the COVID lockdown was March 2020. So it was a very strange time to be returning from maternity leave because it, it, it was a case of everybody was working from home and, you know, everybody was kind of adjusting to that new sort of schedule. And it, so it, that was that was quite unusual. Um and then this time around, I told my line manager after my 12 week scan. Um, and I'm very lucky in that my contract end date has been extended since then. Um, and I think it's, it's going to be extended again for what they were saying. So, um, 
that's quite lucky in that the the I'm a gen com fell out. Um and so there's funding now available for me to be able to take maternity leave and then return and continue with the project. So um I've been very lucky in that sense. Um so there's there's been an impact on on my work in the sense that it's been delayed, but they've extended the term again so that I can finish the work when I return. So yeah, that's quite lucky. Mm-hmm. No, that's good. It's um I was just thinking about how I told my line manager as well, obviously last year. I um I was terrible when I was pregnant. I just didn't tell people for as long as I could get away with it. Not necessarily at work, but in my personal life. So there are friends that I have who don't live nearby who possibly don't know that I have a child because I just never mentioned that I was pregnant. It seems a bit too late now to mention it. Um but <laughs> which is terrible. It's I think there's something wrong with me. Um And I was wondering how long I could get away without telling work because I was just like, oh, this is such an awkward conversation for some reason. And then I found out that I had an abstract accepted for a conference um, for the Alzheimer's Europe Europe conference in Helsinki. And that would have been when I was 35 weeks pregnant, but I really wanted to go. And it was literally like we found out what I had my 12 week scan. And then it was like the next day I had the abstract accepted and I was like I'm gonna have to say because I can't be like oh yeah I'm booking on and then them find out later you're like heavily pregnant but it was fine um both of you touched on something there that I think is really important to talk about which is the research environment I think is is quite a unique environment when it comes to having a family and taking time off because of the nature of contracts being quite short term or kind of doing a PhD or what have you and I wonder I mean this might be a bit of a personal question but to what extent or Mm -hmm. did it to any extent um the nature of those short-term contracts kind of impact at all on your decision to start a family or on timing of those Mm -hmm. things for example um Mm -hmm. Ashling I see you're kind of nodding yeah it it definitely did I mean um me and my husband both you know we knew we wanted to to have kids and we both actually did PhDs kind of quite close uh, together in terms of time um, and we knew it was going to be a challenge to try and work out a good time so first time around we thought that a really good time to have a baby was just after you finished your thesis or while you're writing your thesis. Um, in hindsight probably not such a good idea because it meant that my lat leave was spent having to do thesis corrections, which I didn't have time to do because baby came sooner than I thought, and then job hunting to get a job. Didn't have much. Um, And then second time around, by the time I felt like ready, so by the time my my daughter was old enough for me to think, yeah, okay, I could do this again. Um, I think at that point I had a year and a half or so left on my contract, maybe a year left on my contract, and I thought, it just it just won't work because I, I promised myself after having to spend a lot of the first mat leave job hunting and the stress that that you know it was really really stressful I was like I promised myself that I wouldn't do that again and so I would make sure that I had a job to come back to so I definitely think that at least second time around it caused a, a delay that ne- wouldn't necessarily have happened if I had been in a different kind of career where it just is like a permanent contract. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I definitely do think it played it played a big role in terms of getting the timing. Um, and I think I was incredibly lucky to have secured a uh, position just as that previous post finished. And now here I am about to go on maternity leave and I'm coming back to nearly two years of a post so it's a huge, huge weight off my shoulders. Um, and yeah, it just makes it much easier. But it is quite, it's quite like, I do find it almost quite frustrating that I had to think of that. You know, I couldn't just, you know, you maybe think, you maybe have friends um, who decide to have family and they just go, yeah, I want to have family. And they just do it. And they don't really have to think about it. I mean, you, you could, and you always work things out and things pan out eventually but I just feel like with this kind of job there needs to be a lot of planning for something that is difficult to plan definitely and like there's all I mean there's the idea of timing 
like you can plan for when you want things to happen. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will that happen would... then. So you might think, oh, I've got like two years left on this contract. And two years can easily become, I don't know, a year or five months or whatever. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Is there anything you want to say about that, Laura? Yeah. I mean, I agree with Ash saying so there'll be um, five years by the time this baby's born between my son and the baby. And it wouldn't have been so long if I hadn't have been uh, on a PhD because I wanted to get the visa out of the way um, before getting pregnant because I'd already, as I said, I was in the very beginning of the first year, really, when I got pregnant. Um, in fact, I must have been about a month into my PhD when I got pregnant first time around. So I basically spent the entirety of the PhD either pregnant or with a very small baby. Um, and that's obviously very challenging, um, especially around writing diseases and things like that. Um, and then this is obviously only related to the UK context, but once your child reaches three, you're entitled to funded childcare, but not if you're a PhD student. So that adds another level of sort of complexity um, where you've got to be, be in a funded position by the time you're three to, to get that childcare. Um, so I definitely didn't want to have a second child before I was in a position that was um, PYE, as in a, a job, so that I wouldn't have to sort of go, go through that again. Um, and I wanted the fiver out of the way um, without having to be pregnant during the fiver or anything like that. So it, it definitely does have, a, have an impact because you do have to think around those practicalities and how that's going to work for you. Um, and I think I was fairly lucky first time around to be a PhD student so early on because I wasn't into the thick of the research. I was still basically carrying out a systematic review. So it was very flexible work um, and that, you know, and it was diff based work. Um, and I think I was applying for ethical approvals and things like that. And then there was kind of a natural stop for me. So I, I sort of, I'd submitted the ethics application and then I went on maternity leave. So I wasn't stopping a project in the middle or anything like that. And I think I've been quite lucky again this time in, in the sense that um, a similar, it's a similar sort of scenario in that, again, I'm currently applying for ethical approvals and hopefully those will be in place when I take the tenancy leave and then when I return, I can stop the data collection part of the, of the project. Um, but it, it, it is complicated because it's about trying to get that, that balance in the timing. And like you said, it's not that straightforward because you're not really in control of your own fertility. So you, you try and plan as much as possible, but, it, you know, what happens happens and, and you just have to kind of react as best you can. It is just such a unique um, kind of environment to work in, I think, and does add this extra pressure. So as I mentioned, like, so I'm a PhD student, I've done one year. So I've got to that stage where I'm kind of finishing up my systematic review. I've got my ethical approval in place. So when I go back, I'll be kind of data collecting. Um, but something that you kind of mentioned as well, Laura, about the kind of, so in the UK context, the government have announced um kind of extending that free childcare. So by the time my child is nine months old, um, there will be 15 hours of free childcare for nine month old babies, as long as you're working. Um, and so there's provision for people who are working, there's provision for undergraduate students. And then there's this gaping hole <laughs> um, for PhD students, um, which man, yeah, mm -hmm. when you're already kind of mm -hmm. on a low, low income, it is just this horrible thing to think about. I was so outraged by it this week that I um, sent just like an email of anger to Keir Starmer as my local MP um, to tell him what I thought about it. So, so that's been on my mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. My next blog post, anyone who's been following those will feature that. So that's something to look <laughs> forward to. Um, well, and then going back to something you were saying earlier, Ashling, as well. So thinking about kind of working during pregnancy, um, you mentioned both times um, kind of telling your employers in terms of a health and safety thing um, or health and safety perspective. And obviously your work very much being lab based and there being implications there. So I wondered um, in what way being pregnant has kind of changed your day to day working life um, in terms of what you're actually doing. Yeah, so there's there's just like a few um, chemicals and things that I can't really 
shouldn't be around. And so um, there's just a few processes where I, I can't do. One of the main things in in my current role is um, I can't be near anaesthetic. So if you're doing any animal procedures that involve anaesthetic, I can't do them. So that entire part portion of my project has just had to be put on hold until I, I return back. Um, but other than that, the, the changes are just quite subtle. Like, for example, asking a PhD student, could you do this particular process for me because I'm not touching it. Um, and actually what's quite quite interesting this time is, so the last time I, when I was pregnant, my, my little girl was born in July 2020. So most of my pregnancy was lockdown. I think I had 12 weeks in the lab before I um, went into lockdown. So I didn't really know what it was like to work in a lab pregnant because at that point, uh, you know, I'm, I must have reached my 20 weeks or something at that point. You don't, you know, you don't have like a, a big belly or anything, so you're not hindered. Whereas this time, <laughs> um, I very much am. And so I'm noticing um, how I can't quite get to the lab bench completely. You know, if you think about when you're trying to wash dishes and your belly like, gets in the way, well, now that's a lab bench and I can't quite reach it. And um, thankfully, the, the, the students in the lab are, are really, really kind in that if, you know, if something goes on the floor or goes underneath something and I'm like, guys, please, <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I think this can't, they'll, they'll help me out with that. And I had to... Um, get a massive lab coat as well <laughs> because um, my lab coat started to not fit and obviously it's there for a reason you know it, it's a health and safety thing and there's no point in me walking around with a lab coat with a belly sticking out of it so I've got this giant lab coat to try and accommodate the bump um, but it is it is definitely quite interesting to be in the lab now that I'm pregnant this time and just realise just how you I don't know how agile you almost need to be to work in a lab or how, how agile I would work in my lab, you know, kind of darting about. Um, and now I'm a little bit slower and I need a bit more space. <laughs> Have there been any um, differences for you, Laura? Because obviously the type of research you do is quite different to Ashling. Um, has it had any implications for kind of how you do your job or any things that you'd usually be doing and not now? Um, not really in the terms that I'm um, largely still a qualitative researcher so you know the, the the biggest challenges I suppose are around things like when you're still if you have nausea during the early stages and you have events or presentations to give or that's obviously complicated but I suppose that's that's true of, of, of anybody when you're in a you know it's difficult to perform when, when you're not feeling very well um I think probably more something that, that you touched on, Emily, um, about conferences um, and about having restrictions around travel. Um, and um, so because I'll be on maternity leave over the summer, which is obviously when quite a few conferences are organised, um, I won't be able to travel to present my research findings. And that's quite frustrating. And I think last time, I think I did um, present to it when I was on maternity leave, but they will, they became more hybrid um, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, and now a lot of conferences have gone back to more face to face formats because they're recognising the value of networking um, and of you know not not watching remote presentations, mm -hmm. which is understandable, mm -hmm. um, and people being there for questions. So I think that's probably the biggest impact that I've seen in that I'm not able to you know attend those conferences, and that that's you know, it's a limiting factor because I'll have to wait until I return from maternity leave, so I'll be a year behind. Yeah, I definitely see that as, I mean, it is quite difficult, isn't it? I mean, I was very fortunate. I think that the conference was just, like, literally just within that window of opportunity for me. I think the original due date they'd given me, it would have been kind of a week over. And then at my first scan, they were like, oh, no, we think that your due date's out by two weeks. I was like, thank goodness, I really wanted to go to Helsinki. <laughs> but then all my colleagues were like, are you sure that you're going to want to go when you're 35 weeks? And I, being me, was just like, how dare you limit li limit me? I definitely want to go. And I was completely fine, so that's good. But I appreciate that not everyone is feeling absolutely fine at 35 weeks. Um, moving forward a bit, I guess, to um, 
thinking about actually preparing for your maternity leave. So Ashling, you're obviously really close to going on to going on. So um, how have you planned for your leave in terms of kind of handing over responsibilities or do you feel like you've been able to kind of um, wind down a bit? Um, Yeah, how's that planning going for you at the moment? What's winding and dying? (laughs) (laughs) No, so um, every time I take any leave, be it like a holiday or whatever, the lot of my nuts always um, always chaos. Um, so as I, as I mentioned earlier on, we we had a meeting with the collaborators on the project before I started, and we did make a plan of these are the things to achieve before before I finish up. So I've been working through getting those parts done. So basically, like I'm banking up cells and things that I freeze down that are then going to be ready for me coming back and things like that. So in terms of like preparing the project for me finishing um that was sort of planned before i actually actually started which, which was good um but of course things always don't always go to plan so i've got my own sort of deadlines of you know or my own things that i want to have achieved before i finished that are just going to probably make this month a little bit chaotic um, but in in terms of other things, like so, like other responsibilities. Um, so I had a student that I was supervising for, uh, like a dissertation that she that she was writing up, and I'm supposed to give feedback, like formal feedback, to it in March, or I think I think the submission date for it is like the end of March, and I really wanted to take on this student and have that, um, have that experience of that was that um, supervision, um. And I wasn't sure if I could because this was a, a you know it was hard deadline. I could I couldn't change it. So thankfully I was able to uh, arrange with my PI, and she's happy to support me. So even though I'll be off, I'll be able to potentially either still do the marking or you know, ch- chat to her on the phone about getting through the marking and stuff. So um, that's another sort of like handover of re- responsibility that I've done. I think I'm still supposed to try and arrange um, a, a kinesiology rep for um, our Alzheimer's Research UK Scotland network. I think I'm supposed to try and find somebody to cover me with my tie once, but, <laughs> but uh, that bit has kind of fallen behind, so I might just have to dip back into that instead, <laughs> instead of finding somebody else. But no, I don't think. Um, I think I'm, I'm pretty. I think I'm pretty well prepared. It is kind of strange this time to know I'm coming back to something, uh, whereas last time I felt very much. I, I mean, obviously it was a research system post that I was in. And it was fixed term, and it would have ended when I was on that leave and things. So it was very much like clear, clear decks. Everything needs to be done. Whereas this time I feel like, oh, anything that isn't finished, that's 2025. <laughs> this point. <laughs> So obviously we're, the three of us are all based in the UK where maternity um, policies are relatively generous compared to a lot of other places in the world, especially places like the States where you're lucky to get more than a few weeks, I know, in a lot of jobs. Um, So how long are each of you planning on taking in terms of maternity leave? I guess in terms of your entitlement, but also what you have decided on and whether that's kind of a movable feast as well. So Laura, how about you? Um, so those time I took nine months, and I think I'm going to take nine months again. Um, large part of that is to do with finance, um, and that's what's funded. Um, so that's what I'm able to take, um, and it worked quite well for me last time because by nine months, obviously, baby's approaching one, they're a bit more stable in terms of this sleep. Their sleep, you know, patterns are a little bit more. Um, predictable and you sort of halfway through weaned. Um, so you, you know, it's, you, it's not that younger baby, um, and and that worked quite well for me because it gave me nine months to kind of enjoy um, being a mom and um, going to baby classes, that kind of thing. But I didn't feel like it was too big of a gap for the research, I didn't feel like I was, um, you know, parking the research project for too long. It felt like a, a, a good time to come back. Um, it was it was complicated for me by the fact that um, COVID happened right in the middle. So when I did come back, I had to make a lot of adjustments to my work around 
around the impact of lockdowns and things like that. But um, for me, that was that was about the right amount of time. Mm. And how about you, Ashling? Um, yeah, so I took nine months the last time for the exact same reason as Laura, and that is what um, you're paid for in um, in the UK. Um, the statutory maternity pay only goes to 39 weeks. Um, this time around, I'm quite keen to take a little bit longer. Um, but most of that has been going to be driven um, by finance, I suppose. Um, no. Because... Um, although you, you can get the payment up to nine months of statutory pay, statutory pay is not very much money <laughs> at all. Um, so um, what's quite what's quite nice, um, in my university at least, is that while I'm off, I'm going to accrue all of my holidays and all the bank holidays and all these things. So it actually means that on the back end of that leave, I can take a bit of time off on full pay because it'll be holidays if I try and use all of them up. Um, so my current plan, which could change, is to have nine months fully off and then start dipping my toe back in. So maybe like one day a week um, until baby, until I've said, go back full time, once baby's one. That is like my, that's my goal. Um, but whether whether that remains full time or whether I drop down to four days or something, um, we've like my, my line manager and I have already kind of openly discussed that. Just, you know, let's see how. Let's see how things go at that point because they're only we once. So I might I might end up taking reducing my um, my work time just so that I get a bit more time with Google. I've um ended up being really fortunate actually in some ways because um when I started my PhD I was still working on the project I was on before and that f- that project finished um at the end of September, after which I went full time on the PhD. But it meant that even though I'd left that job it was so close to my due date that I still got statutory maternity pay Um. for the entire nine month period Um, and then with my PhD I get a full stipend for six months so actually that nine months of um, statutory that I'm kind of accruing Mm. pays for like a full extra three months for me so I can take nine months without any concerns which is literally like manna from heaven (laughs) when you're on a PhD stipend Um, but yeah, it feels, you know, knowing some of my friends, for example, who live in the States and seeing, I mean, one of my friends, I remember with her first, she was entitled to two months from her employer. Um, and just think, man, like the idea that I would be back at work already seems really hard. So I guess to some extent, I need to be grateful for the provision we do have here. But um, it's easier said than done, perhaps. Um in terms of your maternity leave, I don't know how much you've thought about what you plan on doing with that time, other than maybe the baby class and that sort of thing. But um, how much are you guys um, planning on still being involved to any extent with work, um, kind of engaging with that? I don't know if you've got kind of keeping in touch days or um, whether you want kind of a clean break for a while. Um, I don't know if either of you want to talk about that a bit, what your plans are. So I'm trying to have the big things finished. So in like papers and things, hopefully they will only be revisions and I maybe need to you know, dip back in and look at. Um I'm ignoring any grant deadlines that I see right now and saying, no, have a look at this again in January and start paying attention to those emails again. So I'm mostly gonna try to not work and enjoy time with the baby and also time with my daughter and not being in lockdown and actually being able to go out and, and do things. Um, but um, my, my university allows you to have 10 keeping in touch days and I'm very much going to make use of those, I think, near the tail end of the year just to pick up on some things like some teaching and just um, starting to get things, getting things organised. But I say that... <laughs> I don't know what what might happen in the summer, you know. I I definitely remember the last time getting very fed up of babies. But maybe it was because I was just in lockdown on my own in the house with a baby all day. I think I spent four months rolling about the floor trying to teach my daughter how to roll because she just would not do it. Um, and my husband's, you know, buying me buying me books, going like, you know, 
maybe maybe you want to read to like try and keep your brain like alive. <laughs> so I don't know. Like I've got all these good intentions of saying no, no work, but I imagine I'm not going to be able to resist, and I'm going to end up dipping back in in the summer or just after. I think like. Um, when before I went on maternity leave I'd said because this project that I was working had come to an end but obviously the end of a project doesn't mean the end of dissemination it means the beginning of dissemination a lot of the time um, and so we we're kind of getting into that phase of writing papers so I remember on my last day before mat leave I submitted to a journal one paper I've been working on and then a first draft of another and my colleagues were like you know you're not going to want to look at this you know you're going to want time with your baby. And I was like, I know myself. I know that I need to keep my brain going in a different way. What? And so, I mean, I'm only three months into mat leave and I'm already just, I mean, I've been into the office twice, like with baby in tow. <laughs> I mean, everyone likes a baby, so that's fine. People will hold it for you while you do some work. But not that this is a model that other people should necessarily be following. But for me, that's... I, I really enjoy work. I like going in and seeing people. I like feeling um, like I'm contributing to life in a way that's not just the life of this one tiny human. Um, so, yeah, I understand the draw to work. Um, how I think about when, you, Laura? Oh, when, sorry, you like, when you love your job, I think it is hard to, to completely detach yourself that way. Sorry, um, I think I checked my emails once a month last time I was on maternity leave. Um, I, di I didn't work at all. Um, I thought I would um, and I didn't. Um, I think I was lucky though in that my maternity was pre-lockdown, or at least the, the bulk of it was. Um, and I spent quite a lot of time building sort of networks for when that I'd be off. I'd have other people with babies the same age. So I spent a lot of time attending baby classes and socializing um with my nct circle um and i was also just very tired I, for, for the first six months um my son didn't really nap other than contact napping um and he also he did sleep but he would wake every three hours so and i exclusively <laughs> breastfed so i spent a lot of time just doing that really um and spending mm. time with 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 other mums um, and kind of um i suppose just getting to know him um which yeah was a surprise to me because i expected to be more interested in work than i would be but um, but i i don't know i i think i think this time i'm going to try and stick to a, a similar model um as much mm. as possible although possibly because i've because I've had the experience before, I think I'll probably spend, I'll probably be more open to maybe looking at a bit more work when when baby's gone to sleep. Um, whereas last time I spent a lot of it either Googling various habits that they were developing and trying to work out whether they were whether they were developing in the way that they should. And then later on, I spent a lot of it um, doing things like baking uh, homemade pinwheels um, for weaning and making homemade purees and that kind of thing uh, whenever he was asleep. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I think I might I might be more open this time. You are putting me to shame, Laura. Like, I feel like that's what I'm meant to do or be like. So I went to one of these, like, it was like a baby music class thing a couple of weeks ago never again I just can't I just couldn't I couldn't cope with it um it was too much and then I I came to the conclusion I'm an adult I'm actually an adult I don't have to do things that I don't want to do <laughs> and so my like the one thing I do every single week the one like routine I have which I would highly recommend to everyone is baby cinema so good I've gone and seen all of the Oscar kind of best picture nominees um cinema like down the road five pounds just so low hassle you're there with a bunch of other parents and babies love it um alas the kind of baby sensory classes I just I don't know like for me it's just not the one but I'm there's so much of it and people get so much from it um so I think I am the anomaly um which is how I end up doing work which is quite sad but then I think my baby is quite good like the minute I put him in his pram 
he will immediately fall asleep. So there's like a coffee shop down the road. If I just wheel him that five minutes, then I know that I can get an hour and a half at my laptop, <laughs> uh, which is very sad, but I don't know, we're all different. Um, so I know that we don't have that much time left. Um, so I thought we'd move on to returning to work. And um, so I know that in a previous uh, podcast on this platform, Gemma Lace talked about how other mums sometimes judged her or she felt judged for going back to work. Um, so what are your thoughts on returning to work? I know, Ashling, you said that... Um, you are going to kind of go in a stepped way perhaps or kind of what will um returning to work look like for you or how do you feel about it since since i've already done it once i kind of know a bit more what to expect so i think the biggest biggest shock for me i don't know laura if, if this was the same for you the biggest shock for me when i went back to work was that i put my child into childcare and then she could never go to childcare because she was sick because she would go into childcare and get sick and then spend all her time at home and me having to be at home or her husband having to be at home because she was sick. So maybe, I guess maybe that's my reason for thinking about going back as sort of phased, you know, one day a week or something, let her get all the bad illnesses. Or I say her, might be a, might be a he. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, let them get all the illnesses out, out of their system um, and then I'll be going you know full time and sort of <laughs> summertime maybe when they're not so sick but that that didn't quite pan out the last time um but yeah like you kind of touched on the, the kind of I suppose like the mum guilt or people kind of judging you for um for working and I certainly never feel like anybody in my workplace like so anybody within academia or within the university or anything like would put any judgment to me working but I definitely feel just kind of more general society sort of I definitely get that kind of vibe that <laughs> I shouldn't be working or I shouldn't be as invested in my career or you know for example when I work late and things maybe people are thinking oh, why is she why is she working late like <laughs> we're doing it because I love it like you know, mm -hmm. um, like give me a break um but then the mum guilt also where it's like, oh, should I be doing this? Should I not be at home? But I know that my little girl absolutely adores her nursery. Our nursery's been fantastic. She's been in the same nursery since she's been nine months old. And the experiences she's, that she's had in there have been just amazing. And she's developed into this amazing little person. And I know that that's not just me and my husband doing that. I know that the nursery are also kind of contributing to this amazing little personality um, that she's developing. So that helps get rid of the mum guilt for sure um and yeah just gotta ignore society i suppose <laughs> don't listen to them and because there's not the dad guilt right like no one's being like why is this dad gone back full time like what is he yeah. doing whereas the expectation is so much like your primary responsibility or your primary role now is a mum um, I was chatting to a friend recently who doesn't work in our field, but she was saying um, when her daughter was in, I think it was, she was in reception or year one or something. And then there was a, a school trip and all of the parents were invited, you know, we need volunteers. If you want to come on the school trip, you can. And she is, you know, she loves her job. She was like, I'm not going to take a day of annual leave to go on this school trip. It's fine. She went to pick up her daughter at the end of the day and out of the 30 kids, 28 mums had gone and so it was only hers and one other child who didn't have their mum with them and she was like oh my gosh I just felt so judged <laughs> for being at work and coming to pick her up um so yeah there is a special societal place for that judgment I'm sure when when she went on a school when she went on a school trip there last year me and my husband were fighting over who got to go actually so <laughs> he was like yeah so I'm just gonna go and I went it's easy when you get to go, why do I not get to go? <laughs> we were like, should we both go? And then that seemed like a wish for us to both take a day off and go. So in the end, I won. I got to go. I was going to say, it probably depends on like where the trip's to. I think this friend, it was like a trip to the local village. And she was just like, I don't need to do that. I don't need to take a day off to like walk to the co-op and like look at the local church. <laughs> Um, I think I've, do you I've, have any thoughts Laura about how you're planning on going back or is that still open-ended at the moment um, 
No, I've I've, I've chosen uh, the nursery. Um, that we're gonna we're gonna use this time. Um, I think I, I'm quite lucky in that I don't know anybody who doesn't work who has kids. So it, it would be far more unusual where I live that, that somebody didn't work and go back to work. Um, and I think one of the things I found really great about working from home is that because we can work flexibly, um, what I have been able to do is if there's been a nativity production, which they try and put at nine in the morning, um, I can attend that till 10 and then just work till six at night. So I'm still working the hours, but more flexible. So that's been really good. Um, and I think she was kind of talking about um, sort of those illnesses as well in the early days when you when you first they start attending nursery. Again, I had a bit of a strange experience because it was the beginning of lockdown. It was very strict bubbles at nurseries. So my son was actually really well <laughs> for a really long time um, because, because nobody mixed with each other. Um, and then it sort of all happened later on um, when they sort of started being a bit more flexible about people mixing and children mixing a bit more but the specific nursery that we had was actually really strict for quite a long time for probably a good two years so I think it delayed some of those illnesses and, and they're kind of happening now um but yeah it uh like I said last time was a very odd experience because um at the beginning of sort of the, the, the lockdown periods nobody as you were saying actually about the labs not being open and people not weren't working in that way anyway so I think it's going to be a bit of a different experience for me this time around because it's more business as usual um mm. when I'm returning um but yeah I'm I'm I think probably because I've had the experience of balancing the two previously I, I think I, I think it, it is fine and I you know I still haven't really thought through whether I'm going to go back full-time or whether I'm going to go back four days um but I think as you're saying that the, you know going to nursery is can be a very positive experience and can really help and um, develop mentally so it's it's about making sure that you're balancing your needs as a mom with the needs as a child and, and getting that that balance right and what works for you works for them no that's so true um yeah I think we're kind of coming to the end now so I'll just summarize what we've talked about so, I mean, I think we're all agreed that there are unique challenges with um, becoming a mum when you're working in a research environment, particularly when it comes to the nature of the shorter term contracts or trying to kind of plan when you're going on leave and not really being in control of that as much as we'd like to be. And the fact that being kind of mums is associated with this kind of societal guilt um, that can factor into kind of how you go back to work. But I guess academia does um, afford some flexibility as well in terms of going back. And it sounds like people have got some really good teams behind them um, who are willing to um, support that return and be a kind of a direct return back into five days or four days or a phased return. Um, so, yeah, it seems like people have got some good plans and some exciting times coming up. So before we go, I just have one last question. Well, it's kind of a two-part question. So firstly, I'd like to ask both of you, what changes would you like to see in the academic community to better support pregnant academics and those on maternity leave in the future? And then also kind of what advice do you have for anyone listening who is planning to start a family, but who might not want to compromise their career? Um, so if I go to you first, Laura. I think it's difficult to say so much what the academic community can do because it's, as we sort of mentioned earlier, academia does tend to be tend to be structured around projects, project deadlines, and um, dissemination work, and it's difficult for that to shift, especially with the funders um, and the way various pieces of research is. I think for me, it's more about. Um, governments within countries providing the correct support so that academic context can do things like extend your contract that bit further so that you're able to meet the needs of the project. Um, I'm not I'm not sure that that's necessarily something that academia itself can do um, because it, it has got those those structures around funding. Um, and I think I'm, I'm very lucky the university that I'm at, I think it 
is really supported um, around academics taking maternity leave and does provide quite a good enhanced package. Um, and I think in terms of returning to work and making sure that you're able to support your own career, um, I think some of that is around sort of planning what works best for you. So looking at what what would you like to do? And, and it might be that while you have small children, you decide to focus on one aspect of your career over another, maybe an aspect that is more family friendly, that, that is more flexible if that's something you need, um, or looking at child pre- care provision so that you can, you know, take on that next PI role that, that, you, that you really want. Um, and just about being pragmatic about what what will work for you and what will work for your children and, and your family. Mm-hmm. And how about you, Ashling? <laughs> yeah, so I feel like, well, you know, as as you've sort of said, the UK like maternity provisions are obviously a lot better than um, maybe in other countries. Um, but I guess this, this is more just in agreement with what with what Laura said and. Um, in terms of like the funding of the contracts, my particular funder um, has agreed to pause my grant so that there's no time lost on it. So the entire period of mat leave will just be paused and start again after. But I know that not every funder does that. So um, that's definitely a, a change that I, I think I think it's I think it's ridiculous that some funders don't pause the grant, but they just continue to run and you lose nine months or a whole year out of your, out of your job. Um, I guess the, the key thing um, would be, I suppose, to end all uh, <laughs> fixed-term contracts. Like, wouldn't that be great? Uh, <laughs> because then you wouldn't have to worry about um, trying to plan and make sure that you've got enough time left in your contract and, and all those kind of things. Um, but that, you know, that that's a work in progress. That's something that we've all wanted for years and years and probably... Yeah, yeah, not quite sure if that's ever going to pan out. But um, one key thing um, that I think would really be helpful would be to like, provide chiker conferences. So there's been a few conferences I've, I've went to and there's been people have had their children there or there's been an option at registration to tick if you want to have childcare. But any of the conferences, that was only con- that only seemed to be conferences that were actually in Glasgow. So I was like, me too. And then the conferences where I was going like away to, um, they didn't have that option. Um, so for a couple of us going down to England, um, it it wasn't even wasn't even a choice. So um, I think that could that could be like a change that could be brought on. Um, and then your the second part of your question um, was what was it? Just advice for people who um, didn't want to like stall their career. Um, so I guess if you just look around, the amount of men and women who are in this career who have children um, so there's absolutely no reason why you sh- should feel that you're going to lose your career but I think um, what's really important and I think Emily you actually wrote up a blog post on this it's like the importance of not losing your yourself um, and I think most academics do feel very much that their career is part of them and you know, they're very passionate it's, you know some days you say oh yeah it's just a job but you know it it is actually a career and it, you know it's a passion and that's, that's how you get there so um i guess it's a it's a benefit almost in like can you have that career drive you, you forward that you don't lose yourself because you still have that bit um and then also just just like embrace it um it's like chaos at the beginning between sleepless nights or being and not getting, not getting, being able to take the baby off you, or then going back to work and trying to juggle everything and sicknesses here, there, and everywhere. But I think you can make yourself a a better researcher because of it. I've um, had more senior academics tell me that um, they find mothers that worked for them were much more efficient than. Um, the staff that they had that were not mothers, um, and you definitely do. You find a way to, you know, you start to rearrange your prior- priorities, um, and do the things that are important, and you do become more efficient. So just, just embrace the lovely chaos of it all, and um, and just go for it. <laughs> uh, 
That's awesome. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about what you were saying there as well about kind of the childcare provision at conferences. I think the same could be said for in terms of how universities could support people coming back is like helping with that provision themselves. Like I know some universities um, will provide um, or subsidize um, kind of childcare within their own nurseries for students. Some don't. It would be great if that was more of a universal thing, um, particularly when, you know, all of these um, in the UK, these government policies are um, kind of working their way down the ages now so that more people are going to have access to um, free childcare hours. And when that isn't um, relevant to students, it would be good for universities to maybe um, have an equivalent provision or um, kind of an equivalent discount or something is what I selfishly would love to see in the academic world. Um, but no, it's been really great to hear a bit about you guys' experiences and um, just for me as well to see that actually you can go on maternity leave on your PhD and still get your PhD at the end of it, which is great. Um, I believe that. I receive it for myself. Um, and that it doesn't mean having to shift everything of who you are, but actually um, you can still go back into that research world, still have that passion for that and um, kind of work things out as you go along. Um, so I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. But if you can't get enough of this topic, you can visit the Dementia Researcher website where you'll find a full transcript um, biographies on our guests, blogs and other podcasts that are on this important topic as well. And um, as I've already shamelessly plugged, you can also read my blogs where I'm kind of talking more about my own experiences of becoming a parent in real time. So um, they'll be monthly over the coming months. And just to let you know as well, so if you have had a career gap to start a family and would like to get back into research, and if you're based in the UK, sorry for our international listeners, um, the Daphne Jackson Alzheimer's Society Fellowships are a really great way to return. And they're currently accepting applications, which I believe close on the 8th of May. And so details of that call and a webinar with all of the information are going to be included in the show notes. So do check that out. So I would love to thank our incredible guests, Dr. Laura Prato and Dr. Ashling McFall. Um, and I'm Emily Spencer, and you have been listening to the Dementia Researcher podcast. Bye. The Dementia Researcher podcast was brought to you by University College London with generous funding from the UK National Institute for Health Research, Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Association and Race Against Dementia. Please subscribe, leave us a review and register on our website for full access to all our great resources. Dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk